London is going taller, fast. Right now, a 309.6 meter skyscraper is about to rise in the heart of the city. And that's just one of more than a dozen towers underway. You've probably heard of the Gherkin, the Cheese Grater, and the Walkie Talkie, but those towers, they're about to get overshadowed, literally. From underground Roman ruins to congested Victorian era streets, London isn't exactly the easiest place to build a skyscraper. But engineers are going all in. They're digging deeper, stacking higher, and squeezing massive towers into tight city blocks. Some of these buildings will rise over 70 floors, with foundations cutting through old rivers, forgotten tunnels, and even unexploded bombs from World War II. And at the top, public galleries, rooftop gardens, and office space that's so high in demand, it's already sold out years in advance. So why now? And how do you even build something like this in a city this old? Let's break it down. London isn't running out of ambition. It's running out of space. With a land area of just 1,572 square kilometers, most of it locked down by centuries-old streets, protected landmarks, and aging infrastructure, there's barely room to grow. And yet demand for modern, high-quality office space keeps rising. The City of London has set a target to add over 1.2 million square meters of new workspace. But with nowhere left to expand sideways, the solution is simple, build up. That's why nearly 600 new skyscrapers could rise across the city over the next decade, many clustered in the east around Leadenhall Street, Bishopsgate and Gracechurch Street. These tall buildings are symbols of a city doubling down on innovation, sustainability and economic resilience. They're also being squeezed into one of the most complex urban environments in the world. Underground lies a maze of hidden rivers, old railway tunnels, and World War II ordnance. Most of it isn't even mapped. Above ground, narrow streets, traffic, and heritage buildings make logistics a nightmare. Still, the need for flexible, green, post-pandemic offices has become too urgent to ignore. Projects like 22 Bishopsgate have already hit full occupancy and charged premium rents showing just how hot the market is for next-generation office towers. This vertical boom didn't just happen. Years ago, the City of London Corporation laid out a long-term vision to reshape its skyline. Planning permissions poured in, many for towers between 150 and 310 meters tall. Some had been delayed for years, others were revised after COVID to meet newer health and safety expectations. Among the first was 100 Leadenhall, a 263-metre skyscraper nicknamed the Diamond. Construction started in 2023 and will wrap in 2027. It will feature angular glass panels, rooftop terraces and premium office space. Then came one undershaft, or the trellis, which will top out at 309.6 metres and include a public viewing gallery and educational spaces. After a design overhaul and final approval in 2024, it's scheduled for construction in 2026. Also in the pipeline is 50 Fenchurch Street, a low-carbon tower loaded with rooftop greenery and passive energy systems due by 2028. Other approved towers like 60 Aldgate High Street, 99 Bishopsgate and 70 Gracechurch are at various stages, while 55 Bishopsgate set to become the third tallest in the city, is moving forward despite concerns over sight lines to heritage buildings. Not everything makes it through. In 2021, the 305 meter Tulip Tower was rejected for threatening views of the Tower of London. And even during active construction, surprises can happen. Excavation at 85 Gracechurch Street uncovered a Roman basilica, prompting a redesign to include a public archeological exhibit Together, these towers represent London's push to balance history with modern needs. But building them? That's a whole other challenge. Let's start underground. Every single one of these towers needs a deep foundation. Massive piles drilled dozens of meters into the earth to support the sheer weight of the structure. But in London, the ground is a tangled mess. There are forgotten rivers, ancient wells, and even sections of the Thames' old tributaries that were buried centuries ago. Some are still flowing beneath the city. Obstruct them, and you risk flooding nearby basements and underground lines. 
Hidden beneath the streets are cold war bunkers, abandoned tube stations and postal railways. Many of these structures were classified until recently and aren't even on modern maps. That means standard tools like ground-penetrating radar don't always catch them. So what do engineers do? First, they run multiple site surveys, including sonar-based and magnetic imaging, just to build a partial underground map. Then they design piles and foundation slabs that snake around these obstacles, kind of like threading a needle through a block of Swiss cheese. It's tricky and expensive. At one undershaft, engineers are preparing to pour foundations deeper than 60 meters. That's taller than Nelson's column. They'll use over 170,000 tons of concrete delivered in batches on tight schedules because there's nowhere to store materials on site. You can't just shut down a London street and stack steel beams on a pavement. Every truck is timed, tracked, and routed in a precise sequence. This is called just-in-time delivery. It's efficient, but risky. If one truck is delayed by traffic, the whole process can fall apart. And when you're pouring concrete for a load-bearing column, stopping halfway can weaken the entire structure. There's another issue, soil movement. Some of the buildings being replaced, like the old Aviva Tower at one undershaft, have been compressing the clay soil for decades. When they're demolished, that soil can expand. Add a heavier structure back on top, and it might shift again, but in new and unpredictable ways. To manage this, engineers install real-time monitoring systems during and after demolition. These systems track movement in neighboring buildings, pipes, and tunnels. If things start shifting, crews can reinforce nearby structures or change construction methods on the fly. But even after you're out of the ground, the job doesn't get easier. London's airspace is crowded, literally. You've got dozens of active cranes working within the same few blocks, lifting hundreds of tons of steel beams and glass panels hundreds of meters above the ground. These cranes are monitored by air traffic authorities, coordinated daily to avoid collisions, and restricted in height and rotation to prevent interference with flight paths and neighboring buildings. On top of that, many new towers include cantilevered floors, sections that stick out without vertical support below. These aren't just design gimmicks. They create space for rooftop gardens, public terraces, or structural flexibility. But they require precision engineering, balancing forces across steel trusses and concrete cores like a giant seesaw. Take the diamond, 100 Leadenhall, as an example. Its angled facade isn't just for looks. It deflects wind loads, reduces lateral sway, and improves aerodynamics. But designing that shape means every single glass panel is cut differently. That's thousands of unique pieces, shipped and lifted into place with zero room for error. And then there's the material problem. Fire regulations in the UK limit what can be used in tall structures. That knocks out many sustainable wood options. So most of these skyscrapers rely heavily on steel and concrete. But these materials come with a high carbon footprint. To offset that, projects like 50 Fenchurch Street are turning to low-carbon concrete, passive ventilation, energy recovery systems, and rooftop vegetation. It's not perfect, but it's getting better. Still, once the towers are up, they place a massive burden on London's utilities. Many of the pipes and power lines beneath the city date back to the 1800s, and skyscrapers don't just plug into that easily. Before construction even starts, developers must coordinate with energy providers to upgrade transformers, add water capacity, and route waste away without flooding nearby systems. All this steel, concrete, and high-risk engineering doesn't come cheap. Each of London's new towers is a billion pound bet, or close to it. One undershaft alone will use more than 170,000 tonnes of concrete, 12,200 tons of steel and 2,000 tons of glass. That's before you even count labor, permits, excavation and utility upgrades. And it's not just the tallest one. Projects like 100 Leadenhall, 55 Bishopsgate and 50 Fenchurch Street each push well past the half billion mark. But the returns? They're just as big. Take office rent. 
The vacancy rate for top grade sustainable office space in the city is currently under 0.5%. That's almost nothing. And as remote work fades into hybrid setups, companies are scrambling for modern buildings that meet green standards and support flexible layouts. Earlier this year, the city's tallest current office building, 22 Bishop's Gate, hit full occupancy. Not only that, but tenants were paying premium rates above market average. That kind of demand has sent a clear message. If you build it high, green and smart, they will come. And it's not just banks or law firms anymore. You've got tech, media and education organizations moving into the mix. These companies want rooftop gardens, communal workspaces, fitness centers and public access points. That's why so many towers now include public terraces, food halls, cultural venues and even education centers run by museums. Beyond rent, the City of London expects these towers to add thousands of jobs. Just one project, 55 Bishopsgate, is designed to host over 7,000 workers. Multiply that by a dozen towers and you've got tens of thousands of new roles in finance, tech, property management, security and hospitality. That's massive economic activity and a serious tax boost for the city. But with all this growth comes some real pushback. Conservation groups, especially Historic England, have raised alarms over visual impact. The biggest controversy hit in 2021 with the Tulip. At 305 meters, it would have been one of the tallest buildings in Western Europe. But its bulb-shaped design and rotating viewing pods were too much. Critics argued it would ruin the skyline and overshadow the Tower of London, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The plan was scrapped. More recently, the 55 Bishopsgate proposal also triggered objections. Opponents said that the tower's height would block protected views of St. Paul's Cathedral and alter the city's historic character. And while it still got the green light, the debate revealed a deeper tension between building forward and protecting the past. And then there's infrastructure. Power, sewage and water systems across London were designed for the 19th century, not the 21st. With so many new towers in such a small area, there are growing concerns about whether the city's utilities can actually handle it. Upgrades are being made, but slowly. In the meantime, new developments must coordinate service routes, pay for utility expansions, and sometimes delay construction just to avoid blackouts or pipe bursts. There's also skepticism around sustainability. Yes, developers are using lower emission materials and improving insulation, but skyscrapers by nature use more energy than low-rise buildings. And fire safety regulations still prevent the use of many greener materials. So some critics argue that all this green building is more branding than breakthrough. Still, the skyline keeps rising. Because for the city of London, the future is vertical. The economic stakes are too high and the demand is too real to slow down now. Keep up with the most insane projects with us. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to Ultimate Mega Builds. Comment below and turn on notifications. See you in the next video.